Hey everyone, welcome to Artist Decoded. I'm your host, Yoshino. The following conversation is with sculptor and artist Stephanie Haynes. Now, if you've never seen Stephanie's work before, the best way I can describe it is that it's representative of the deconstructed female form. And to me, viewing Stephanie's work feels like looking into a funhouse mirror on psilocybin mushrooms. The further one investigates, the more granular the investigation becomes. The work is wonderfully complex. It has feelings of pain and triumph and comments on feminism and the challenging of the male gaze. We talk a lot about creative process in this episode, as well as the transformation of Stephanie's identity throughout the past few years. If you'd like to check out Stephanie's work for yourself, you can find them on Instagram or on their website, stephaniehaines.net, or at artistdecoded.com. I'm thrilled for you all to listen to this conversation. It touches on breaking down traditional patriarchal norms through artistic expression, and Stephanie recommends various authors and books in this episode. They also talk about artists they study under while getting their MFA at RISD. Links to all of the above are included in the show notes of this episode, if you'd like to check them out for yourself. So without further ado, here's my conversation with sculptor Stephanie Haynes. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks for doing the podcast. I've wanted to talk to you for a while. So I'm glad that we can do this. Well, thank you for having me, Ashina. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, I want to read you the first paragraph in your bio, and I feel like this is a good place for us to start the conversation. The analysis of visual culture is a central focus in my work. The issues of gender, sexuality, race, and power permeate into all aspects of our society's visual culture. As John Berger observed, men act, women appear, men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. His idea is that the nude in Western art reveals a taming of the female body, creating and distorting ideal beauty, in quotes, conceptualized by male artists. The devastating implication of this work in general appears to be that women's bodies cannot be portrayed other than through the regimes of representation, which produce women as passive objects for the male gaze. And I wanted to bring this up because, because to me, your work speaks in a very abstract way of the reclamation of that gaze from the male viewer. And to me, it deconstructs and obliterates the female form. And it also distorts the perception of societal beauty standards away from the male gaze, while at the same time creating a type of poetry and visual expression. And I remember we were talking on the phone the other day about the way that that was perceived, your work was perceived by male professors while you were an undergrad. And I was thinking to myself that maybe because they were viewing your work through their own distorted male lens. And I'm curious what goes on your mind when you're creating these sculptures. I don't really... I guess, have a distinct idea. Sometimes I do, but in most cases, I I work fairly intuitively. So I'll just start with a basic idea. And a lot of the times, like maybe I'll start with a, um, a pose or something that is referential to historical art paintings or westernized historical art paintings. And um, like I get started and then I kind of, as I describe it to my students, I kind of work as an architect in some ways in that if it's going one way, um, I always am thinking about balancing the sculpture because ceramics is totally weighted by the earth, I guess, of gravity. So it always wants to pull it down. So I always have to balance the sculpture as I'm, as I'm working. And then a lot of times it just like reveals itself to me. And then a lot of the time I am really kind of feel very uncomfortable with what I'm making because I feel very like I've never seen it before in some cases. So it makes me feel like 
I'm always questioning if it's the right move because it's so weird or just like out of this realm of thinking. Um, but yeah, and then I, I think inevitably the idea of the female gaze comes out in the work because I'm always trying to think about how to make the internal self into the external world. So um, kind of what is it to inhabit a, a female body is something that I think about a lot in my work mm. and thinking about gender and my own battles with um, my own gender identity and just what it, it means to have this body, I guess. And, and a lot of it has a lot of pain, like, I guess I think a lot about, um, like the violence that happens to female, uh, female identifying, female presenting, female bodied people in our society of, uh, and I don't know, I guess, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just listening. I'm just listening to you. Yeah. I mean that, that makes, that makes sense. And it's kind of funny to think about trying to describe visual art sometimes <laughs> because <laughs> that's kind of the idea behind it. I, I feel is that there's so much of that grappling with the human spirit and these, I mean, at least um, speaking of your work, you know, it feels like all of those emotions and all of those feelings are embedded within the way that you sculpt and there's a certain fluidity with that. But then I can also understand that tension and you can feel that tension in this sort of body horror <laughs> kind of aesthetic that you have. But I think it speaks much deeper to that. And that's the kind of thing that, <clears throat> that I want to explore with you. Um, I mean, on an aesthetic level, I love your work because it's just, it's just, it's so fascinating to look at, you know, but I, I think that, um, yeah, I'm just curious, like more of, of, of your thoughts on your work. Well, I, I use some techniques called nemesis in that I, it's like, it's the very same, but very different in a lot of ways in using like ideas of Western art painting or just the female nude in those kind of instances. And then I like to flip it on its head so that maybe you've seen it before, but yet it's not something that you've seen uh, before, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, I guess. And a lot of the time I am thinking about fluidity of movement because our internal self is always changing. It's always molding. And I guess if you think about it in particular with female bodies in general, they're always changing to suit the patriarchal norms of the time. So like when I was in high school, it was like in the early 2000s, it was super thin, skinny, and just how uh, it ch like women change themselves like every like couple of years. It's always like some new fad of how to be and pleasing to the male gaze. So mm. I always feel like there is like that distortion that happens when um, when you're looking through that lens of the male gaze. It's not as pretty as you'd think. And then it's just a lot of times like when I look at my own reflection within that culture or that society, it's it's kind of like a carnival mirror in that I rec recognize what's there, but um, it it isn't reality. So I, I am always looking at that distortion. Yeah. And then recently with my, um, I guess, Inglay's luster work, like the shiny uh, multifaceted surfaces, um, when you look at yourself in the, in the reflection, it's quite distorted, distorted. Like it is almost like, you're part of the sculpture because mm. you're just as distorted as the, the figure. Yeah. So are, are, are you talking about 
the glossy surfaces in your actual pieces when you're looking yeah. at yourself in oh okay yeah because yeah. uh i guess my earlier work was quite matte mm -hmm. and i used the technique of chiaroscuro so i would shine light on the work and then i would draw it on with underglaze pastels so i was thinking more like a painter how to like create form with this and I know it's really hard to tell from the, the photographs because it you, you might think that it's just the light hitting it, but I use really neutral light. So it's it's literally I paint the how I want the light to fall on the pieces in the earlier work. And then now I'm doing uh, what is called Inglaze Luster work. It's kind of nerdy clay stuff, but um, <laughs> yeah, I it's... Like it. It's um, a technique where you take all the oxygen out of the kiln at a certain temperature and then it draws the metals to the surface and then it creates a mirror-like surface. It's a technique that was used over 3,000 years ago in Iran. Um, it's, it's kind of like a really, at, like it's really hard to find any writing about it. It's just you have to test it and mm. just have to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of where my research on material sciences have, have taken me. And then I feel like that's how it works within the work. Because um, mm. I feel like everything means something, even if you're unconscious to it at the time. Would you say that your approach is more intuitive and as if you were a artistic scientist, if you will? in terms of the technical aspects and then later you put meaning into it or do you think that uh or how, yeah how would you how would you describe your process in that regard um like i mean i read a lot or i i guess i used to read a lot i do still read as much as i can um whenever i have a moment to, mm -hmm. to picking up my my kids at school well while they're well while they're playing at the playground i'll just try to read something but um i usually i kind of feel like a lot of that internalized like feminist theory or just um queer theory and i guess uh i like to read um just philosophy in general um i like feel i feel like when you read it you absorb it and then if you work in an intuitive way I think it comes out through your hands, even if you're not um, like, I feel like I'm pretty unconscious to it sometimes, or I just kind of let, I get into the, like that zone where I just allow myself to kind of flow uh, with what I'm making. Cause I feel like if I c try to control it or plan too much, it becomes stagnant or um, I guess overthinking it, can create a stale kind of sculpture and sometimes i i just like to be a little bit more free form with it and sometimes I, i'll like put a limb on it and then I, I don't like it so i'll just cut it off that's the one thing that i like about ceramics is that i kind of get to a place where it's finished or i'll just like say i think it's finished or else like i mean i've sometimes go overboard on them <laughs> sometimes i go too far and then i can always walk it back a bit but i feel like that's why clay is such a beautiful medium in that i'm not really confined to how i work with it um i guess it does have its limitations like everything but um i think it's for me it's the best because i mean i've done metal i've done um a bunch of different other mediums and i just i always found it was so repetitive like you you make the piece you make the mold then you have to make the metal and then you gotta you know but weld it all together <laughs> buff it up and then you get your final piece whereas in ceramics it's just like i feel it's more pure in how y your expression is like you could still see like your finger marks and I, I don't know if you've seen like ancient, well, I guess First Nation pottery. You can like still see the fingerprint and it's like. 
What is that? Uh, what what oh, is that t- technique called when you leave the fingerprint in? Um, like it's like when you're pinching, coiling, you can you can leave the finger mark there. Um, no, but, but there's I a think... specific there's a specific word for it that I can't think of right now. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I only bring this up because I, I had a, another sculptor on the podcast and he, he said that specific word and I just can't, I can't remember it at this time, but it's essentially like, um, you can either sculpt it out or you can leave it in. And that mark is a, you know, it's a representation of the artist's hand. And oh, I think cause I listened to that at Brian Booth. Yeah. Brian Booth Craig, yeah, uh huh. I think he called it fractal or something like that. Ah, that's it, that's it, yeah, yeah. No, I I just, I was just, well, as you were speaking about that, I was just reminded of, of that episode, and and I just couldn't think of the specific word because I'm not a sculptor, so I don't, I don't, I also don't know these, (laughs) you know, these uh, a lot of these techniques, obviously. Oh Um, no worries. Yeah, I, that was the first time I've heard of that, uh, and, and then. Um, so I was listening to his podcast, uh, and yeah, he, he mentioned that it was called fractal and I thought that was interesting. I've never heard the term before, but I guess, um, you know, you learn every day about like what, how other people speak about their work and what maybe things that they've read, um, to kind of talk about their, their practice. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, me too. Yeah, so I, I guess like, you know, just to draw a bit of a timeline here, but I know that you were born in Alberta, Canada. Is that correct? Yes. And at what point at what point did you realize you were an artist? Well, I mean, I took art in high school, but I went to uh, an extremely small school. Like the town I grew up in was the first I guess I grew up on a farm and then the nearest town was like 300 people. And then the next bigger town where I went to high school was like 2000 people. Wow. So it was really small. Um, so, I mean, I think the art teacher that I had there really nurtured, you know, like art making, but I, I was always told that it was like a hobby. It wasn't something that you should pursue in real life. Did you internalize that for a while? Uh, Of course. I mean, I started, I started school to go into pre-med. And then I did that for a year. And then I decided to take a year off and I worked a bunch of odd jobs uh, to go to uh, Europe for the first time when I was 19 and I, I lived in, in Germany as a, as an au pair nanny <laughs> and learned the language and then tra- uh, traveled Europe. And then that really was a, I think a pretty transcendental moment for me, uh, because I just hadn't really experienced anything outside of that little small town and city. Um, so like going to to Europe and just kind of like the people that I I lived with um, they had kids like later in life and it just kind of showed me a different way of living because I guess like Alberta is what I would consider like it's like the bible belt of Canada it's kind of like Mm. Texas in a way (laughs) Mm. it has it has big oil and you know kind of Christian ideals. Um, and so going to another place was really free for me. And then I, I started art school when I came back. I, I, I wasn't sure where it was going to take me. I thought maybe, you know, the practical side of me was like, well, well, I could go into architecture or, you know, art therapy or something, you know, I, uh, so I just enrolled at the at the local community college, Red Deer College, and then I, um, I think it was there that I realized that I wanted to pursue art full time, and then I uh, 
finished my degree in, at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Now it's called NASCAD University. And yeah, when I took a, I guess it was my final year and I took a feminism postmodernism class and it really changed my life and it gave me a purpose in my art making that I, mm. I don't think I had be- before. So what, what sort of, what sort of, um, I want to ask you about the sort of feminist books or authors that you, that most resonate with you. But I also uh, keep on coming back to this idea recently of that everything happens for you, not to you. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially as, as artists, we can utilize the things that happen externally as a way to channel those through the medium, right? So whatever medium that would be for you, you know, drawing ceramics and painting. Um, I'm sure, you know, you do other art forms. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, going back to my question, but what sort of feminist uh, texts or authors resonate with you? Um, Actually, my first, uh, I guess, love was Bell Hooks, actually. And unfortunately, she just recently passed. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I found Bell Hooks was probably one of the most influential to me at at the beginning of my my journey. Because um, I guess, as I said, I took that feminism postmodernism class. And it was really geared to, like, you know, white intellectualized feminism and Mm. i and i really didn't like resonate a lot with that um like the teacher would really try to humiliate (laughs) in front of everybody because you say humiliate you in front of everyone yeah because i don't know i i had never taken feminism before and at the time i was young like i was you know 20 years old and um well i guess yeah, it's like 22. But I was like wearing like Amber Crombie and I had like my long blonde hair and was still very much part of the patriarchal image. Mm. Um, Sounds like me, except with the uh, around 22, except for uh, not having long blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, like, I think people just didn't really take me seriously as a person and just, yeah. Um, they would, or she would, um, really try to like, well, do you know what this means? Do you know what this word means? And then I would say what I thought it meant and and she would be like, no. And well, anyways, at Mm. the end, I, I really resonated with Bell Hooks because she was the most accessible feminist I've ever read at the time. Um, Mm. I know there's a lot more like feminist texts now uh, that are like more accessible but at the mm. time um, ha- yeah. have, have you read um have you read uh, Ch- any uh, Chun Man and Ngozi Adichie's work uh no but I should uh, I think I, I have all of these authors I have a thing that I'm like you need to read all of this BIPOC philosophy um, I do I, I guess the most recent uh, book I read was Legacy of Russell's Glitch Feminism. Um, mm. Just because a lot of my work has that glitch aspect, the in betweenness, the the fluidity mm. of like, in a way, transness. Um, mm. What What is that book about? And I guess a nutshell. <laughs> it's just, uh, I've never read that book. It it kind of talks about like the subversiveness of in-betweens and um, this glitch in the, in the matrix, if you will, or glitch <laughs> in the system well, like uh, yeah. kind yeah. of is a subversive act in that it's, it's like against the grain, it's rubbing against the grain of the system. So you only really know that it's there because it's glitching. Right. And so it's like disturbing the, the metaverse or it, it's it gets more into ideas of um like online personas um i don't know if oh, you that's know interesting. donna haraway's 
cyborg manifestos at all. No, I need to, I need to read some of this. I'm a, I, I'm asking a lot for myself too because I'm <laughs> getting a lot more into feminist text myself. So, um, well, uh, Donna Haraway, uh, cyborg manifestos, um, kind of talks about like how ungendering, um, like the I guess online spaces can be. Uh, she kind of has it, it it's more of like a, a beacon of hope in, in a way in that you know you can like kind of be genderless when you're in um, like a 3d uh, program you can become anyone you can yeah um, kind of you're not no longer bound to societal expectations and, and norms um, but if we're looking at that in a patriarchal lens, it kind of becomes a more like a scarier place. Um, so it's kind of like a call to, you know, queer folk and just uh, people, gender nonconforming and maybe female bodied people to get more into like the engineering aspect of online spaces so that you can create your own like kind of utopia in a way. <laughs> mm. Um yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think it um, it goes into that kind of theory uh, a lot. And I guess, um, I mean, during this pandemic, I've been doing a lot of thinking <laughs> about my own um, gender expression and uh, and like just how I identify and like childhood experiences um of kind of like as a as a child i i literally thought i was a boy and i couldn't understand that my mom was putting me in all these dresses and mm. um i just hated it and you know i wanted to be a boy and i mean if i would have lived in a different time i don't know how things would have changed for me or if I had parents that were more supportive of that. Um, so, I mean, I, I do have an aspect of transness in my work um, because I don't fully identify with being a female. Yeah. Um, so uh, right now I, I've recently transitioned into they, them, even though I have my own reservations to be like categorized. Um, but um it's it's something that I think about and mm. just my own queerness in a lot of ways of I would say I'm like more pansexual and you know mm. and I guess right now I I'm like more feminine presenting and you know I I don't know I guess it's just something that I was really thinking about a lot during the pandemic and just maybe in relation to my own work as well because like why is this moment of in between and transition really important to me too and you know I could tie theory to it and um, thinking about like as I said like it's always changing f f like mm -hmm. I still feel like I I can't escape the patriarchal gaze or just like you can or can't can't i can't because i still yeah. sometimes want to feel like pretty or like for my partner's sake or i don't know it's just like i want to feel desired you know yeah um, i don't know <laughs> no i know yeah no i mean i can i understand well, I want to say I understand, but I, I can understand and empathize to the extent that I can being a Japanese American male that hasn't necessarily gone through the same experiences that you have. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what sort of thoughts were going on in your head during the pandemic in regard to your identity, too, because identity is such a an interesting topic to me both from a personal aspect but it's also in the collective consciousness being presented a lot and maybe it could be because of the pandemic and this sort of opening up of consciousness from 
social change to environmental change and issues to for some people and I hope for most people a change in awareness um, and a change of relationship to past ideas whether that's in the patriarchal sense or whether that is in I mean you could examine it from multiple angles but I guess going back to my question what sort of thoughts have you been thinking about during this pandemic that relate to your identity um I guess it's really complicated for me because like I was pregnant during the pandemic or partially and it was really I don't know I guess I just become pretty confused (laughs) when I am carrying a, a baby inside of me and it's just like I like it really messes with my sense of self in a lot of ways or just uh, I don't know it's like I I guess I don't have the same or like you know like the stereotypical of how you're supposed to be when you're pregnant or Mm -hmm. just uh yeah I just I'm like I don't put pictures of my kids online uh a because I don't feel like they're not consenting yet um I guess. Um, so I just, yeah. I guess I don't really flaunt that aspect of myself. Not that it's bad when people do. It's just, I, I don't know, I guess. I, sorry. I'm still processing. Oh no, no. Yeah, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, part of myself. But, um, I think before I didn't really come to terms with it because I felt like I was too old or something like yeah. I, I, I just always felt like maybe I was too old to like do it or that it kind of seemed like I was getting on like a trend or um, I don't know. So I just really I was really uh, opened up by my students because I have a lot of queer uh, non-gender conforming students and um, they were actually really helpful in like, you know, pushing me to 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 well, not push me to do it, but you know, they were supportive of me. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, cause you and I are relatively around the same age. I mean, I think we're like a year apart and yeah. the baggage that our generation grew up with, with this aversion to anything that doesn't exist within the box of traditional societal norms and culture and when something went against the grain, you know, these talks about um, queer identity and anything related in that, in that aspect, you know, would be seen as like a negative thing, you know, when we were growing up. Um, mm-hmm. Or at least uh, I'm, I'll speak from personal experience from when I, when I was growing up. And like how in just 10 to 15 years, when someone's 10, 15 years younger than us, uh, how much their perspective has changed and how much more accepting a lot of people are of different types of identities, right? And I think there's something really beautiful of that. And I'm not saying that that's for everyone, right? There's Mm -hmm. a lot of people who still exist within that patriarchal sort of lens. But... I think that there is, and and maybe this is just the optimist in me, <laughs> you know, I'm just being optimistic that the next generation and the generation after that will be much more socially conscious, environmentally conscious. And um, I think it's important to have these sort of conversations and and even being able to grapple with that, whether it's in your artwork visually or whether that is, you know, through dialogue and open dialogue about these things. Because what I've been thinking about a lot recently is that it's okay not to know. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to be able to grapple with these things that we might may have demonized in our minds before. And it's okay to be confused. But I think the disservice to ourselves is not being able to go in the underworld, examine that pain, examine that shame and all of those things and not be able to try to sift through that. Right. I think that is a disservice to ourselves. So, but, but I mean, going back to your artwork too, I mean, I, I see all all of that tension in your, 
in your artwork and the way that you create. And, and again, going back to the first part of the conversation, it's hard to like describe visual art. Uh, so I encourage anyone that's listening to this to go to Stephanie's website and go and check out all of her artwork or go to, <clears throat> go to our website and, and check it out. Cause it could be on there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess it's, I guess by, I think a lot of the times I do look at things and I try to like, look at signs and symbols and like, like as something that we were kind of talking about was uh, a, priori, a priori and a posteriori in in that like yeah uh just just for the just for the audience those are two projects that you worked on between 2010 and 2013 is that correct yeah but it, it's also like a like it's a it's like emmanuel kant's uh a critique of pure reason was the was the book and it i guess i'm really interested in signs and symbols and um semiotics and uh, semiotics is like kind of the study of language and how it functions and hmm. just how every like in other languages um everything has a gendered aspect to it so if it's like the table it's like a masculine or feminine hmm. aspect of that object so um a lot of my work is and self is like I read philosophy to kind of deconstruct my own ideas of myself or, or things that I have done or been in um, like in the patriarchal framework to like myself and like kind of like the violence that that does to myself um, because of the patriar patriarchy. Um, hmm. So I guess yeah. a lot of my, I, I am really interested in unseen systems of meaning. Um, so I think um, I, I, I kind of go into like deep dives on that. And I, kn I know like, yeah, I don't have to have the answers for everything. And I think it, it is okay to be unsure because I mean, I think that's where the beauty happens in a lot of like, just in life in general and just also like always reaching for that random like more or like that that place that I can't attain yet because I don't maybe have the consciousness to get there but also maybe I do in my unconscious mind um like so I guess I just I think that it's really interesting to try to get to that place of unknowing and uncertainty because yeah. I think that's where a lot of interesting like artwork comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. And also, and also to re remind ourselves, like at least I find this to be helpful for myself is just to constantly remind myself that it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm saying this to you, right? Like, but it, I'm actually saying, you know, it's okay not to know because I'm trying to reaffirm that to myself as well, that it's okay not to know. And I think, you know, speaking of the patriarchal perspective, I think it's a very pervasive sort of ideology to have to think that we have the right answer. And in fact, having the right answer in our patriarchal society gets rewarded a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can think of that in terms of politics, like, uh, Trump, for instance, he basically just said a lot of things, but he says it with such authority that uh, his believers, if you will, you know, we can liken him to maybe a cult or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, his, you know, believers like will think of it as gospel, like he's some sort of like prophet, mm -hmm. right? And because he has such a strong stance on his political agenda, you know, people believe that. Right. So, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think, uh, and there, there it is again, like, I don't know. Right. We're, we're, we're exploring and examining this extremely complicated existence that we're currently stewing in as we're talking. <laughs> and, uh, 
I don't know. I, I guess the, the older I get, the more questions that I have towards things and the more that I, I think like, do I actually have the right answer? Did I ever have the right answer? <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. These are just things I think about a lot. Well, I think the more like reading I do, the more like, I guess, internal, like, um, I guess, decentering myself or just trying to read other experiences of other people. And um, I feel like the less I know, you know, like the more mm-hmm. you like open yourself up to different ideas and, and um, theories and just experiences, the less you know about anything, I think, because it's like, everybody has such varying experiences and there's no like unifying like nobody can have the same experience so like why are we trying to make it like this is it you know you can't really say like that you're right on a certain theory because you know look at freud you know a lot of his (laughs) uh theories were are debunked or whatever but now like he he put it out there you know and Mm -hmm. then as fact and then through investigation you know things change and it becomes passe and it's no longer valid you know because we time is moving it's so fluid that you know it's always changing and how do you like represent something that is always in flux like you just can't do it you know and once you name it, it becomes false unto itself. And I guess that's like Nietzsche. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this recently came up in a conversation that I was having with one of my friends, one of my best friends, actually. And yeah, this is from the Lao, Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching. And those who know do not speak. Those who speak do not know. And, uh, I don't know. I guess I, I just. I guess I've been thinking about that a lot, especially in the way that everyone, or not everyone, but a lot of people nowadays want to be these sort of self-help gurus, or they want to project to think that they may know the answer, and but maybe they're just lost. They're trying mm-hmm. to seek their own answers, and then so in this context, it's sort of like uh, in the biblical sense, it's. Uh, the false prophet and then those who know do not speak and those who speak do not know. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when people are, they have a certain amount of confidence in their language and how they project themselves into that. I guess it's like kind of like neoliberal stuff on the internet in that, you yeah. know, everybody has their facade on online and it's like what is your brand and it's like i don't know i i struggle with that uh too <laughs> with thinking about how you put yourself out into to be consumed by other people um i don't know i guess i've been kind of silent on my social media because i've been really thinking a lot about that or just how I don't know I want to be careful in a lot of ways um and I don't know it's just I haven't figured out that yet (laughs) yeah I understand I understand it's also interesting how pervasive consumerism is not even just in the materialistic sense where you can buy anything on Amazon or you know various platforms but also in the sense of social media and how social media adds into that consumerism because you are now the product that is being sold and you are trying to sell yourself. Exactly. And that could be seen from various degrees and how that plays into identity and the way that you may or may not identify yourself, whether you're conscious of it or not. But I do, I do want to go back into, into some of your work, like more specifically I saw a huge shift in your work when I was looking online at around 2014 when you started to get more into ceramics. Mm -hmm. Um, 
or at least this is what it would seem like based off of your website. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that's when you went to a residency in Rome. Is yes. that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Okay. And so I wanted to know what exactly changed within you during this time period. Um, I guess I, uh, I had my um, firstborn child and I was, I, I don't know, it was very traumatic birth, I would say. It was, hmm. uh, it was pretty awful. <laughs> um, mm. So I think a lot of that informed my work and just thinking about like ideas of the vessel and like how women are seen as vessels for the future and, and kind of like downplayed their significance in, in, in culture. Like a lot of, a lot of the times it's, seen as women belong in the in the home and they're not like meant to like push out and I guess like because I come from a pretty conservative like family and I mean for me to go and do that thing and tell my partner like yeah we're doing this and you're not going to stop me type thing because I need to do this for myself so I think it was like a lot of battling with my myself and just like what does it mean to be a female bodied person in society especially right after having a child and you know like the expectations of that of you uh, I feel like you're the most surveyed in like pregnancy and it's like people watch you and like make sure that you're doing the right thing right and you know even afterward it's like oh you're moving your kid around all the time they're not going to have like a normal you know they're not going to be normal you know that kind of Mm -hmm. thing and I don't know it's just it was a lot of internal struggle I think when I went to to Rome and then also just being in such a like western historical uh, place I really got into thinking about mythology and in, in particular, the Medusa was a really interesting, like, because she was everywhere. And then I was just deep diving into what uh, the Medusa, like, in symbolism and just in general, it's, like, a lot about, like, slut shaming and just that, you know, what does the female gaze look like? Because she was could turn men to stone it was like she had this power that needed to be extinguished and i think in in a lot of ways uh that's what has happened in like this extinguishing of the female female powers because it's like the patriarchy knows that that is actually a very powerful thing so it's like you have to extinguish that um so i guess Going to yeah. to Rome was a way to like build my portfolio and just also, um, yeah, it was like a big shift for me because it was something that I I really wanted to do in in my life was to kind of pursue uh, art, but I I just really didn't have the the capability to do ceramics on my own. Um, it it requires a lot of uh, financial like you need to buy a kiln you need to have a space and yeah. you know I just didn't have that at the time so you know yeah going to Rome was a was a big expense but I, I kind of felt it was like an, I was investing in myself I guess in like mm-hmm. experiences and um, trying to push myself further than I've ever done before like I mean in undergrad I did like smaller figures but there I was doing full size figures um and and i did it in like seven sculptures in a two-month period so it was like really intense working um to kind of make that experience and then i had a a solo show there so it was kind of like 
expanding my portfolio, I guess, <laughs> yeah. was a, a yeah. big thing in the early days, I think. Well, and it still is. I, th- I think I think it's just what you have to do sometimes or just, you know, like this preset idea of what you need to do. And I know you kind of talked about it in some of your previous podcasts in, you know, going to school and then like, I guess I felt like I was kind of like an idealist when I left undergrad in that I'm like, oh, I don't need to get a master's degree. And I just really, and I tried on my own for like, I guess it was five years to just make a go of it. And I just Mm -hmm. kept getting rejected over and over again. And a lot of the times, like if I got a response, they would say, uh, contact me again when you have your master's degree. Hmm. So I think times are changing uh, more and more. Like I see more and more artists. Like I think that's one thing that's great about social media is that it gets your work out there. Like before, like 10 years ago, you were totally reliant mm-hmm. on your professors to help you get opportunities and or, you know, mm-hmm. be references and like nowadays i don't think you really need that as much so yeah i I don't know you you have like this preset idea of how an artist should be and i think like especially like living in la i think you have like galleries and like opportunities are pretty abundant there it feels like Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean there's two things that come to mind one is the seduction of what big cities offer and how that could either positively or negatively help. I think the biggest attraction to stay in a big city is because of those opportunities in whatever field that you may be in those sort of connections that you can gain from that. Mm -hmm. And that's just my own personal reflection, but I'm curious what made you want to move into getting your master's degree with all that being said. Um, was like, I felt like I had to, I felt, felt like that was like the next step in being an artist and the evolution of it. And, you know, like I never, like, I didn't go straight from undergrad to masters, um, like a lot of people do. Um, Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I had to have like a, a place where I was at, like where I wanted to go and like have a, a distinct direction when I got there. And kind of go in there and like just get that paper, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and then get, <laughs> get <that> out. Paper. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, uh, and I mean, RISD was really great. Um, I got to meet like crazy, like famous artists, like uh, Carolee Schneeman and like the Astrid Gates. Um, they these are all people that like you were able to like have a conversation with it was it was pretty wild in that and like Simone Lee was a, a like a, on my thesis committee uh she's a pretty big ceramic sculpture artist and from New York and yeah uh Katie Shimmer and I also went because it had a very like uh like a diverse faculty and mostly female faculty mm which yeah. I, attracted me to to them. Um, but yeah. I think, yeah, it was, as I said, I, th- I thought it was like the logical next step. And I think coming from Canada, it's very, uh, like I was looking at, there's like this one job opportunity in Canada and everybody has a PhD. Like it's just people mm. get, go to the max on their education there in a hopes to get a job because there's so few uh art universities that mm-hmm. like there's like i can name it on two hands how many there <laughs> are so wow. when a job opportunity comes up there it's like yeah it's phd uh it's like highly educated kind of thing so i guess maybe it's maybe where I came from um, it's just ingrained. Maybe uh, it mm-hmm. feels like that's what you have to do to be successful. And also in Canada, like a lot of people leave 
Canada to live in the U.S. because it's just there's more opportunities uh, for artists. Yeah. Well, I mean, from I mean, just want to view your website and your work at RISD during 2015, 2017. It really expanded. There's a lot of experimental play in here from what I can see. And I mean, I can tell that there's a lot of growth that happened during this time period too. Oh yeah. I think definitely because I don't know, like I, my previous work, I was always trying to capture this idea of movement and change in a sculpture, but I just really didn't know what that looked like. And then I did like analog photography uh, at, at, at RISD. And then I was doing a lot of like projection into mirrors to like fragment things. And then uh, I was doing a lot of experimental film too, because that was something that mm-hmm. I was really interested in doing, because I, I didn't get to do like photography in undergrad or anything like that, so um, yeah. it was really awakening for me, and I think it really changed the way that I saw my work, too. Um, doing other mediums uh, helps me kind of see my work more clearly, and also, like, before I did a lot of drawing, and drawing from life figure mm-hmm. kind of stuff, and I mean, I have a lot of students that are like, how did, how did you learn to do figure? And I just, I'm self-taught. Like I didn't have a class that showed me how to build big figures. It was just, you have to have uh, the courage to just try. And like every time you, you make something, it gets better. And sometimes things fall apart, blow up. Uh, I've had several sculptures <laughs> that just <laughs> just totally failed, you know, but you learn a mm. lot in those failures on what you can do in the medium. But I do think that doing other material explorations helped me a lot in understanding my own work and just like what I want to see visually mm-hmm. in some cases. In, yeah, in I could see that sculptural work. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Going, yeah, going back into y- your work. I mean, I'm just viewing it on the computer right now. I- I'm curious too. Like, where, like, did you sell all this work, or like, where <laughs> do you store it? I mean, just from a logistical standpoint. Yeah, I have, I have storage units all over the country. No, <laughs> well, kind of. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there was a time where I like I still have a storage unit in in Providence. Uh I had work in LA <laughs> and I I got all yeah. of that now. Uh, it's all here in Seattle at the moment and then I'm trying to consolidate everything so that I can like have it all in one space or place. Um I would anyways. Um yeah, that's it's I don't like the bigger stuff, I, I've i only sold like one or something like that, one or two. It's not lucrative. It's not something I do for money. Uh, like that's why I'm like a professor and that it kind of helps me do my own research, still create work, but have um, enough money to kind of sustain my yeah. self. <laughs> You know, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's usually like my smaller pieces uh, are the the things that I can sell. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess I don't really make work to sell so much, or I yeah. try not to think All... about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and who knows, like over over time. But I mean, your work is just it's so fantastic, and I could just see any one of these pieces being displayed and like a big museum and you know I, I think a lot of the times you know that's what people aim for right and whether that occurs or not um you know it's just it, you're not really in control of that right but i think the work itself is just such a i can feel the grappling of so much pain and emotions and different 
complicated things that we've been talking about, it's all in there. It's all in your work and it's done in such a emotive way that I am kind of, it's fun. I don't know. I think I'm a little um, timid about how I describe it because it's hard to describe. It's hard to describe work in general, but especially your work because of how abstract it is but it's just th- such a visual, visually poetic. Yeah, your your work just has so much poetry in it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it has a lot in it, and you know, sometimes I can like I can focus on an area and kind of talk about it, but like I, it, there is so much going on in each of the pieces that I'm thinking about, and it's really I find it difficult to talk about, and that's why. A lot of times I, I have to write like essays or, you know, try to contextualize things so that I can like, um, I don't know, narrow a focus for a time um, because a lot of the, it's so vast, I guess, in a lot of ways of thinking about uh, embodiment and the mm-hmm. corporeal um, and ideas of the body and you know um what does it like in the ego i don't know i talk a lot a lot about uh like psychology in in the work and um yeah and i guess just how people relate to it is interesting yeah Um, i know we we were talking about that before a bit how people sometimes will ask you like what's wrong with you <laughs> or something, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe, maybe you should pose the question, well, what's wrong with you? Yeah, well, yeah. I'm just so flabbergasted when that happens. I'm just like, wow, you have like some confidence or something. Like just they're so self-assured or something to like say that to somebody. But I don't know. Yeah, it was like RISD open house and there was just some – bro came in and was like some bro it's always the bros <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i just call him a bro because it was like what's wrong with you i don't know it was just <laughs> i i just don't even know oh. what to say in those moments it's just like i don't know just go away i don't really know but i i guess mm-hmm. i i always like think of things to say after people leave you know i think that's typical <laughs> yeah. it's like you're just so like struck by it but you know, it really depends. I think everybody looks at things with their own experience and maybe some people find it disturbing and then other people feel comfort when they look at it or they feel a belonging. Um, So it's really kind of subjective, I would say, on how people relate to it. Yeah. And I always find that to be... interesting about art in general is you know you and I could watch a film together and uh, based off of our experiences and what we've been through it could be deeply impactful or not (laughs) right or we could have so many different perspectives and emotions on it Um, a film that comes just to mind right now is a promising young woman Oh, Have you yeah. seen that film? Well, I I watched like because I don't really get to watch a movie all the way through right now. Uh, I did watch mm. the beginning of it, and I did really like this idea of the gaze in that. Um, mm-hmm. There was those construction workers that were like whistling at <laughs> her, and then yeah. she just stood there and stared at them, and then they were totally uncomfortable. And they're like fuck you bitch you know like what the fuck you looking at you know and that just shows (laughs) you the power of the female gaze like it just totally changed like the power dynamic and i thought that was interesting but the one thing that i was kind of worried about in that is you know when women do have that agency a lot of the times they're met with violence and you know her going home with those people those nice men you know like i don't know like i think in real life it would be a little darker to be honest Mm. (laughs) or maybe i just 
Um, I guess yeah. that's through personal experience of, you know, cause I'm, mm-hmm. I'm pretty timid or not timid. I'm not timid. It's just like how people perceive me. And I think it's because of, you know, social conditioning, like from childhood, it's like, you're as a, like as a female body person, you're not like, supposed to take up space you're supposed to be accommodating you're supposed to be nice at all times um so these are things that i i try to like undo in myself but um they still are there in some ways and you know sometimes that attracts like that kind of that person like that kind of man i guess and you know when you're not what they think you are it's like you're met with like um some aggression i think in in some ways yeah (laughs) yeah no i mean i think that's definitely something to to talk about well and even just anybody that's feminine presenting is like a lot of times like met with violence unfortunately in our patriarchal society so i think it's just um i think that's what feminism and you know queer theory um are, are are just intersectional uh feminist theory is you know trying to get rid of that kind of aspect of of violence and i think that's my ideal situation where people can just be who they want to be without any kind of uh re- like i mean present mm-hmm. how they want to present and and yeah and wear what they want to wear without fear of being beaten up or sleep with who they want to sleep with without fear of being accosted um, on the street, you know? Definitely. (laughs) Oh yeah. 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 And I mean, going back to what we were talking about earlier about the generation ahead of us, that consciousness shift. And I think that, you know, it's good that there's a lot of these documentaries now, like the one that I was telling you about, what were they thinking? The one with Judy Chicago, were Mm -hmm. you able to take take a look at that at all? Uh, I haven't got to yet, but I know Judy Chicago's work pretty well. So I I can guess what it's about. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You probably, maybe you probably know it more in depth than I do. I just watched this documentary, but uh, also another one that I watched recently um, specifically speaking about women in the film industry is called this changes everything. And that documentary featured, it was, um, I believe it was executive produced by Gina Davis and it's, uh, Gina Davis, Meryl Streep, Rashida Jones, uh, and a bunch of other amazing women actors in that, in that documentary. I thought that one was really good as well. So I think like, I think that as like cis, men we need to be challenged in this way you know and i think that the more open that you are like i i would hope that i am you know open and i want to learn you know about the struggles of different types of people and and yeah i don't know i think that just hopefully makes you more of a an empathetic person at the end of the day yeah, I I definitely, I guess, bringing it back to being a professor, I, I do a lot of, like, empathetic work or just, like, trying to, like, expand students' consciousness on ideas of sexuality, gender, because a, a lot of these students are super young and have never been exposed to that kind of thinking. And maybe you know, they might have an aversion to it, but, you know, at least it gets them thinking Mm -hmm. (laughs) about themselves in, in a way that maybe they haven't previously. And, you know, sometimes I get, you know, students writing me like I was in business, but, you know, your class made me realize like, what do I want in life? And they like changed majors or something, even if it's not an art, because, A lot of the times, like, I don't teach art majors. Um, It's just, like, people that have an interest in art. And at the UW, it's, um, they actually are mandated to take a art. Well, it's not, it doesn't have to be visual arts. It could be anything within the arts 
in general. Yeah. And a lot of the times people want to do visual because they don't want to do writing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so I get uh, all sorts of students with different backgrounds. So, I mean, it's kind of like the joy of, you know, molding, you know, some the next generation in some ways uh, yeah. to think a little bit more. And also they're in art anyway. They're interested in art. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I guess it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, to be a professor. Mol- molding is uh, quite a direct metaphor for this conversation. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think, uh, yeah, and that's good. I mean, to be able to be that beacon to shine the light on much deeper issues within our society, I think is to be that access point, I think it is very important, you know, and there's a big responsibility of being a teacher. I mean, you're teaching them, but you're also learning from them. Right. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it goes both ways. And I definitely have to go into it with a lot of empathy because sometimes people talk about really personal moments in their life and, you know, and how it's relating to their art. And um, I guess it's something that I had to learn as an artist is because I used to do like more self portrait esque things or like some things that were directly related to my own experience. And I think sometimes you have to learn to like, be able to push yourself outside of your own work and like talk about issues that are important to you so that more people can feel attracted to the work. Cause if it's so, you know, in a way your own self, you know, it it kind of becomes gratuitous in some ways um, in that people might not be able to like have a kinship to that experience. But if you like open it up to like a larger idea or theme, it's it's easier for people to sink their teeth into and put their own experiences in that, um, I guess, theme mm-hmm. or aspect of the work, I guess. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I, I am definitely an introvert, so I feel a lot, <laughs> I, I take on, on a lot of uh, emotion from other people so it can be also draining like sometimes Mm. like coming home (laughs) from from work like critique days it's just like oh it's like it's so emotionally uh, draining but Mm. i I mean as i said always at rule with empathy um, for anybody's experience no matter who they are like even if they don't have any kind of trauma or whatever you know it's like trying to empathize with anybody anybody's experience yeah well no i mean it's also maybe it could be too that they're just not like the their trauma is under the surface yeah so maybe they don't even know or they haven't come to consciousness of the things that maybe they should deal with or they need to deal with certain pain right but i think the thing with artists is that we have these mediums to be able to grapple with the pain and you can go as deep as you want to uh depending on how much of a challenge you want to take on but you may feel a lot more (laughs) um but anyways yeah no i I appreciate oh wait what were you gonna say something oh sorry yeah like i think art can be cathartic like, like you were saying, like that release of, you know, pent up emotions or just once you get that idea out or that feeling, um, it can be cathartic, a cathartic release. So, or else it could be more traumatizing. I don't know. Depends sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Something I've been, I've been, uh, just when I write a lot, I, I write a lot of maybes and perhapses in there Mm -hmm. and I think it's to mm, not come to a definite conclusion on an idea you know like things change and mold and and our 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 ideas of ourselves change over time that lens 
So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just something I've been thinking about. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate you, you know, taking this time to uh to be on the podcast and exploring a lot of these ideas with me and uh and sharing sharing your truth. You know, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, def- no, definitely. Is there any um is there any advice or anything that you would like to give to maybe a younger crowd out there? I think the best advice I've ever been given is don't stop making. Um like even if you're doing a whatever job, find a way to make work no matter what. It doesn't matter if it's not the medium that you like to work in, like just like, like I did drawing, uh, cause I had no other like kind of financial mm-hmm. ability to do anything but on paper and, or any like cardboard. I mean, Basquiat did mm-hmm. that, um, you know, so I think it's just don't stop making is what I would say. And, I think it's just believe in your truth and, you know, just go where your intuition lies on what you have a drive to make. Um, and then you'll find meaning within that Mm -hmm. eventually. So I think that would be my advice. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Seriously, I appreciate you taking this time like, and sharing your thoughts. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. YouTube and creative support is by Tyler Scully. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.